Good morning and welcome to today's uh, Army Finance and Control Profession Series. Um, I'm your host, Sahib Singh, and it's a pleasure to, um, you know, welcome our guests today um, who are coming in from the United States Army Financial Management Command, uh, specifically the, the Army Financial Services. Um, so we have a bunch of different guests that are going to be coming online and we'll share uh, lots of exciting things that are happening across the enterprise. Um, and not for the Army and its war fighters. Um, and, you know, again, for the guests that are tuning in, um, you know, as we go forward, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat box and we will we will publish those um, as, as the segment goes on. So without any further ado, um, we're going to go over to Mr. Ken Crowder, uh, who will give us a brief introduction and talk about the Army Financial Services. So over to you, Mr. Ken Crowder. Good morning, Sergeant Singh. Um, thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what AFS does. Uh, as AFS, we have the, we have the overall mission uh, to provide some financial support to, to uh, expeditionary as well as garrison finance offices. Uh, AFS is comprised of six divisions. There will be three divisions that you will be hearing from today. And with us this morning, we have the accounting Division Chief, along with Kim Hood, along with Ezra Peoples. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit about e-commerce or uh, the uh, the support for that e-commerce provides, e uh, particularly with one card. Uh, and that will be done by Mr. Chad Samsel. And then next we will have uh, uh, the LDTAs, or which would be, I guess you could say, the Lead Defense Travel Administrators. Uh, that will be headed by uh, uh, Gail Thompson, and along with her would be Ms. J, Mr. J.T. Sablon. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you as the moderator, and then uh, you can tell us which way we need to go for next. Awesome. Thank you, sir. So uh, we're going to begin uh, with our AFS accounting team. So um, we're going to speak to uh, Ms. Uh, Kim Hood, and we'll also speak to uh, Edra Peoples. So uh, over to you, uh, ma'am. Thank you, Sergeant Singh. My name is Kim Hood, and I am the Division Chief for Accounting Operations and Oversight for the Army Financial Management Command. I have been with the Army since 2004, and I've been with Yusuf Femcom for the last eight years. I started out with the USPFO for Indiana with the National Guard, so I come with some expenditure side experience and then had the opportunity to come to Yusuf Femcom where we impact our actual financial statements. So I've been from one end of the spectrum to the other during my career. For our actual division, we are responsible for the oversight with all of the information that comes from the commands that go together to form our trial balance that gets submitted to DFAS, where they take that and um, make our financial reports that get reported to Congress. So after the commands have executed and input their information in GFIBs, if there's any cleanup work, our team does that cleanup work before it goes forward um, so that you all can have additional funds in future years based on your execution from the current year. That's amazing, ma'am. So, so ma'am, um, recently, and especially when we look at accounting and stuff, um, before we even get to, to that, we actually usually look at um, you know, year end, which is actually rolling up uh, on us pretty soon. Um, so recently, I believe there was a mock year end that just took place. Uh, can you talk to us a little about that? Yes, I'm actually going to turn that over to Miss Edra Peoples, one of our lead systems accountants in the accounting team. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edra Peoples, and I began with the government in 2008. Uh, for DFAS, and that was around the time where GFIBS came on board. So while everyone was running away from GFIBS, I was one of the runs, one of the runs running to GFIBS. I actually love GFIBS. Uh, from an accounting standpoint, it just made sense to me. I moved over to Yusuf Com in 2016, and I currently work under Mrs. Kim Hood as an accountant. My area of expertise uh, would be anything general ledger related. And I absolutely love finding errors in the system and trying to find a solution to it. Now, mock, mock is a preparation for year end. The purpose of mock is to properly prepare us for year end. We actually have three mocks going on at the same time. One for GCSS Army, 
one for GFIPS Maine and one for GFIPS SA. I know this may sound chaotic, but with the help of teams and under the leadership of Mrs. Hood, it, it actually runs logistically like a well-oiled machine. Well -oiled machine. Um, each system makes a copy of the production at a, uh, a particular moment in time, and they transport it over to a test environment. All the, the participants for mock they work out of this test environment. So we're using actual data in the test region. This way, we can simulate what we're going to do with this data at year end. This is a benefit of mock because we're actually able to get ahead of problems that may be forthcoming. The commands are not involved with our mock. The primary um, participants of mock are Army Share Services, the Army Budget Office, DFAS is DASA 4, DASA FM, FM, DASA FM, <laughs> it's a dollar DASA, DASA FOR, DFAS Indy, Rome and Columbus, DHA, GCSS Army, GFIPS SA, GFIPS PMO, GFIPS um, BI team, USAFMCOM SSO, USAFMCOM AFS, and USAFMCOM GFIPS SA. <laughs> I think I have them all. Okay, and so although we're all separately located, we have one goal in mind, and that is to deliver an, a quality financial trial balance to the department, the Defense Departmental Reporting System, and also to support DFAS Departmental in the creation of audible financial statements. Awesome. So a lot of enterprise work that's happening on, on your side of the house. Um, so let me, let me ask you a question then, you know, as the commands prepare for their year end, right? How did y'all's team's uh, year end look as well? Well, when it comes to both of the commands year end and our year end, we have two main things in common. That is hard work and a lack of sleep. I love that. I know, <laughs> as of 930 um, at midnight for the commands, it's pencils down. For us, it's penciled up. Our year end begins after midnight and it goes on through October the 5th. Now, although the commands are not physically involved with us after year end, a lot of the things they do prior to year end affects what we have to do on our end. For example, if they have any open commitments or any sales orders, the DFAS team has to track all of these balances in the status of funds. And we, our, technical need, our technical team has to manually draw down all these balances, so it takes a lot of man hours. Also, the commands are involved. We send them a canceling year payables report and they tell us which ones need to be carried over into the new year as a contingent liability. And after we send our trial balance to DFAS, the commands are back on deck to review and certify their year end reports. So the Army year end is, is not a success without every, everybody involved. And so it's a total team effort. Gotcha. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Um, now, obviously, you've been doing this for quite some time, right? Um, and, and so has um, Ms. Kim Hood on the accounting side of the house. If, if there was some advice that you can provide uh, to the commands, um, we'll start with you, ma'am, um, Ms. Hood, that is, and then we'll come over to you, uh, Ms. Peoples. But how about you give us something that, you know, a command can do to better prepare themselves for a uh, year-end close? Well, I think Edra already hit on some of them. The biggest thing is to make sure that if you have open commitments, that they have been moved into an obligation if they are actually going to be executed. If you have sales orders, draw those down. If you've received a MIPR and you're not using all of those funds, send them back where you got them from so that they can actually use those funds on their end. Making sure that um, everything you can do from an execution standpoint, you get done. If you know that you are going to be paying a vendor, don't wait until noon on the 30th and certainly don't wait until 11.59 p.m. on the 30th to execute a contract. We have the ability to create a mod if it's necessary to make sure that you can obligate those funds because if you don't get that done by midnight on 30 September and you have to go back to ASA FMNC on 1 October, there are a lot of hoops to jump through to be able to execute prior year funds. So looking at your reports on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, making sure that you continue to do the JRP, the new dark Q plan, looking at all of your balances, clearing out your unmatched transactions. We know we talk about this all the time. You have to clear those unmatched transactions. But if you don't have those recorded properly, you have no idea how much buying power you actually have when you look at your status of funds. Awesome, Miss. I appreciate that. Uh, Miss Peoples? 
if you want to add to what you've already shared? Yeah, I think she pretty much covered it all. Preparation is key. OK, well, we got a question um, from the field. Um, there are two questions that I would like to divert to you all. Um, one of them um, has to do with GFIP.SA. So if this is not the form that we need to answer this on, um, you can skip over that question. But the question says, um, as GFIP.SA was recently implemented, what are some of the lessons learned during the mock closeout? Um, so that's the GFIP's question. So if you again, if you cannot answer it on this forum, do not. And then the second question is, how are contingent liability tracked once canceled in the GFIB system? So from a GFIB's SA perspective, this is going to be our second year end close with GFIB's SA. So thankfully, we've been through it before. Like Edra said, we um, we mirror each other because those they're both ERPs with GFIB. So we've had lots of lessons learned for many years on the GFIB side. From a GFIBS SA perspective, I would say it's the same requirements that we have with GFIBS. Commands need to make sure that they're closing their sales orders, that they've got their execution all in order. Awesome, awesome. thank you. What about the, uh, the did we answer the second question? So for the uh, canceling year accounts payable, um, the first thing that we need to make sure commands are doing, there is a report that can be pulled at any given time in BI with those accounts payables on there. Be looking at those. See if you have vendors that sh you show you need to make payments. If it's a reconciliation that needs to be done with a contract, get it done. Work with your contracting office to get that taken care of. If you are definitely going to have a payment to a vendor in the future and it is at canceling year, you've had five years to get them paid or they've had five years to get you an invoice and it's going to go forward. It is the responsibility of the individual command to track that from that contingent liability perspective. We only report it as a whole dollar amount when it goes over for financial reporting and we don't look at it on the backside. There are specific uh, transaction codes that need to be done to pay that contingent liability and that information is out on the PSW website about that. And if you have additional questions, I would recommend that you get with the SSO team uh, by opening a help desk ticket. Awesome, ma'am. Thank you. So, ma'am, uh, one final question before we, we move on, right? Um, again, you know, you being here, the expertise and the SMEs, um, we figured this was going to happen. But um, someone's asking, what is your suggestion on how to clear aging obligations? Well, I guess I would wonder what kind of aging obligation it happened to be. There's uh, multiple types that we would have out there. If it is for uh, a future vendor payment, work with your contracting office. If it is a contract that needs to be closed, if you are waiting to get an invoice from a vendor, get with your vendor pay folks or whoever actually works those to see if you can reach out and get that information. If you haven't received the product, figure out if you're actually going to get it or you need to cancel the order to get rid of that in the system. Um, when you look at it from um, other types of mods, you shouldn't have any miscellaneous obligation documents on the books if you don't know for sure that you are going to be able to roll that to an actual contract or something that's valid. For DTS, if your folks aren't filing their vouchers, get with them, figure out you know, at the command level what your policy is. If they didn't actually do the travel, get it de-obligated in DTS, not GFIBs. And that de-obligation or cancellation of the trip in DTS will then de-obligate it in GFEBS. Uh, Ms. Head and Ms. Peebles, thank you very much. <laughs> we appreciate the quick bottom line upfront answers. Um, again, I'm sure that there's going to be some questions that come in in, in, in a few. Um, but what we're going to do at this time is we're going to we're going to move forward, and we're actually going to speak to. Um, a team that's actually tuning in all the way from uh, Kuwait. So uh, it's my pleasure to bring on uh, Sergeant Major retired Sam Sell. Now you know he goes by Chad. So uh, Mr. <laughs> Sam Sell, over to you. Hey, Sarge Singh. Um, good afternoon from our side of the pond. Uh, good morning for everybody on the other side. So as Sergeant Singh said, I am retired Sergeant Major Sam. So I. Retired in 2019, came on to the e-commerce team um, back in 2019 as the e-commerce sustainment team lead. Uh, and I went on the team uh, doing the sustainment wellness visits of, and that such for all of our locations across the globe that utilize our e-commerce systems. 
And then just recently uh, in the last year or so, I've become the Eagle Cash Stored Value Card Program Manager. Uh, uh, and right now we are going through our global footprint of trying to implement the new one card to all of the uh, users out here to replace. So I believe we might have had a technical audio issue. All right, so no worries. This is um, you know, this is what happens in 2022 when you're trying to have forums like this. Um, you know, and you're using technology, right? It's it's not always guaranteed. So obviously we had a um a audio issue uh with the team over in Kuwait. Um Mr. Samsell, are you on or now? All right, well, we will keep the show rolling. And what we'll do is we will actually um, skip over um, Mr. Samsell as things get better, um, and then we'll bring him on. But what we'll do is we'll go forward and we're actually going to speak to the lead defense travel administrators, um, and we'll cover different things over here. So for all you folks who love DTS or might not love it as much, right? Um, these th This team over here is going to provide a lot of good feedback. So over to uh, Ms. Gail Thompson and um, JT Sablon as well. And for the, for the audience, I am going to uh, publish a, a group box email for this team. So if you have any further questions later on, you can always reach out to them. So over to you, Ms. Thompson. Good afternoon. Um, or good morning, sorry. Um, my name is Gail Thompson. I have worked with DTS since 1998, started at the pilot program. So this has been my government career. Um, and our vision for our team is to provide you guys any support you need as a, at the command level, um, resolving issues, working with DOTS, getting people trained. Um, I have 24 people in our team. Um, some are here in Indianapolis. Uh, about 14 of them are out at military installations on site. Um, we are available for anything you need when it comes to DTS. Um, our job is to guide, train, advise, um, help you resolve the issues you're seeing. Um, so that's kind of our focus with DTS. Uh, it's just making sure that the Army commands have that assistance if they need it. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, um, overall, I know you kind of gave us your breakdown of, you know, what you all are doing. Um, but let's talk about the LDTA mission, right? Um, and the support the DTS Army community uh, gets through supporting um, the various folks in the in the commands that are using DTS. Um, how how is that uh, accomplished? Uh, for not only the executing organizations, but all those travelers that are using the system. So we do have a Army 2.5 help desk, um, and like Sergeant Singh said, he's gonna post that link in there. Um, our mission originally started in 2004 under DFAS. We recently moved to use of FEMCOM about a year and a half ago. So a lot of the links and the information you were getting via DFAS have moved over to the use of MCOM side. So if there is something that you need from us, obviously shoot us an email, we'll get back to you and let you know what's happening. Um, we are also putting information out on the use of MCOM website as far as data repositories and stuff that you can get to. Um, the new Army business rules will be coming out at the end of the year. Uh, we're trying to do the best we can to get the Army what they need for DTS. Um, but we have a lot of functions that we provide. So we have compliance tool administrators for the Army. We have um, folks that are doing debt management. We have people that are um, providing assistance for separation of duty and permission level review requirements. We do them every year. Um, I think this next year you'll see us starting the training online in about January, February. Um, and then that separation of duty requirement kicks off in March. Um, and what that does is it looks at all of your commands and says where you have some things that could be considered violations or things that you need waivers for just to make sure the Army's tracking. Um, we also provide uh, both with trainers going to your location and here in Indianapolis, trainers for your DTAs. So your administrators and your commands can get with us um, and we can set up that training either at your location or here in Indianapolis. Um, and we have training both for the basics, 
just coming in and learning how to work the program. We also have an enhanced course that goes through debt management reports, errors, a lot of the more detailed stuff um, that you're going to see as you spend time in DTS. Um, so we also have online courses for your AOs and ROs. Um, and Mr. Sablon will talk about the imp improper pay rate. Bottom line is the best way to reduce it is to train your folks to do what's right. Um, and we know that DTS, you know, people are just trying to get the mission done. Our job is to help you do that within the confines of how it's supposed to be done. Um, so like I said, we have regulation folks, people that know the, the regs inside and out. We just have a lot of uh, availability for information. Um, most of my folks have been on my team for over 10 years. So we have a lot of knowledge sitting there waiting to help you guys. Um, so like I said, you can send us an email. We'll also give you our um, help desk phone number. We can put that out. Um, but just know that our mission is to be there to help you guys do this the best way possible. We're there to help your commands get ready for what's coming in the future and how to be successful today. And that's the biggest mission for us. Awesome. awesome. Ma'am, um, can you tell us about maybe some upcoming developments with DTS? Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about my travel or not. Um, so with DTS, the biggest thing is we just need to be preparing for what's moving forward. Um, there are uh, contracts for the uh, commercial travel side of it that are going to be changing and we need to make sure that the commands are ready for that and that they are preset for a successful transition if there, if one happens. Um, but training is always our big focus um, and trying to make sure that what's happening in DTS um, maintains the Army standard and the Department of Defense standard. Awesome, thank you. Um, so a, a random question came in and it seems like it's it's more of a, a, a want versus a need, um, but but we'll ask and maybe this is something that you all have already thought about. And, and they're saying there's any chance that they can add buying an extra steam in DTS for U.S. personnel versus you know, several calls to CTO or uh, and waiting on the phone. Unfortunately, when it comes to SATO um, or to the, the TMC, the bottom line is, is that DT, the Department of Defense is aware that there is an issue with those phone lines and with getting through and with the timeliness. And they are working that at the DOD level, trying to figure out what, what is the problem? Um, is it a manpower problem? We, we don't know on that side, but we are working to try and figure it out and resolve it. I can add to that too. Okay. Hey, uh, this is JT Sablon. Uh, reference the increase of travel. Just want everybody to know that Mr. Manzel uh, is having a bi-weekly meeting with the TMC to improve their hiring uh, process, what the status, uh, their chat feature, and the long wait. So understand that as much as went out about the uh, delays, and yes, we have to wait two, three hours, but that's the whole uh, industry and DOD and also in commercial uh, vendors. So I just want to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, for the audience that's watching, a couple, couple of uh, things. So I did publish the, the group box that you can reach them on, um, and we'll do it again towards the end. Um, and, you know, for folks, if you're having audio issues or your, your screen is saying that the live event has not started, just log out and come back in. Um, that's on your end. It's not on this end. Um, but now what we're going to talk is improper payments. So we're going to go over to uh, Mrs. Sablon. Yeah, thanks. Uh, another question I've surface there for Gail is the is DTS and right now as we speak uh, DTS is supposed to sunset in 2026 and DOD's new generation travel system called uh, My Travel is supposed to be implemented for the Army in hopefully the next few years so the integration part between GFIPS and and SAP Encourage key if there's no integration nothing happens so just so you know that uh, it's gonna uh, sunset 2026 can can units request change requests? They can, but the certain criteria, for example, if it's uh, improper payment, always your controller says you need to do that, then we can uh, do changes. But right now, it's on a uh, sustainment mode for DTS. 
So anyways, here, my name is JT Sablon, and I'm, I'm with the uh, AFS. My direct, my boss is Colonel Chris Hill, Director Kenneth Quarter. I served uh, just a few years in the Army, uh, <laughs> three decades and eight days, no, no one's counting. And uh, uh, all those years, all but uh, six years, uh, I spent in finance, the finance score. Three years was being a fuel recruiter and station commander, and the other three years was budget. After retiring from the Army in 2017, I guess uh, the Army felt sorry for me, gave me a job in use of FEMCOM and DFAS. So I've, I've gained a lot more experience in working with military pay, all compost, active component, guard and reserves, uh, work mobilization, uh, retired pay, and of course the fiasco that happened in um, the old Walter Reed uh, uh, 2007 uh, wounded warrior. So now my role here is everything travel, uh, P, uh, PCS, TDY, civilian travel, policy, and of course the implementation of my travel of the new generation. But uh, first slide, please. Just want to give you a little pictorial here. The uh, Payment Integration Information Act 2019, that's actually public law 116117. And that is a perpetual effort for DOD to reduce improper payments and uh, meet uh, policy compliance. And just so you know, those two are the financial management top priorities. So what is an improper payment? Well, an improper payment is a payment that should not have been made, an amount that's not right, or a payment that's delivered to an eligible. For the Army, I want to thank you folks out there, particularly finance, because the last previous three years, the Army has exceeded the DOD's goal of 5%. However, this year, this fiscal year, if you look at your chart there, it's not the traditional FY as Kim and Edris has talked about, it's actually from July through June. Um, so that's going to be below, not sure why they have below 3.48 uh, for that. So we team up with DFAS post pay review uh, very well with them. As a matter of fact, we have a customer update that tells the Army our performance, give us the analysis monthly, and then we distribute those lists to the Army so they can fix their vouchers. Uh, Kim talked about DTS. And that has not changed. Uh, it always and always has been. Travelers come back from TDY, PCS, and they file their voucher. You know, five days, five working days. And key to this is uploading expenses, their receipts, valid receipts. And the third one is making sure approving officials just don't look at the vouchers. They have to actually open DTS. You know, compare what I'm claiming and what the expense is saying the receipt, and then approve it. And that way the travelers can get paid timely and accurately the first time to preclude due orders. If you do those things, uh, it's gonna increase efficiency and readiness and the travelers will stay uh, mission ready. So any questions on improper pay? Uh, so far, no, then we can continue moving forward and as the questions come in, um, we will get those. You already covered um, the, the you know, potential new system that's gonna come in the near future. Um, but since you did mention, um, you know, PCS and stuff, there is one question though in reference to um, how much emphasis will be placed on using the DFAS smart, smart voucher in the future. The smart voucher and DFAS that's being used right now, the travel direct. Uh, what the Army is actually focusing on is a smart voucher for PCS military right now. And actually we're doing well as far as promoting that uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, we had asked the uh, Sergeant Major um, of the ASFMC to talk to the Sergeant Major of the Army to put that message out to make it mandatory for, for soldiers to uh, you know, work the smart voucher. That is going to take some time because our question is, if we're going to force soldiers to work smart voucher, uh, what about the officers and what about the civilian personnel? So that's going to be a really hard nut to crack, but it, it can be done uh, just like, you know, EFT, right? So we are working with that right now. It's for PCS and a few other categories, but it's just for PCS right now, military PCS uh, going. And it's, a, it's intuitive. It's similar to the uh, commercial like uh, tax return. I can't use, I can't name the the, the software because I'll get in trouble for that, but it's intuitive, it's dynamic, and uh, and people like it actually. Uh, the response we get from the highest level of the army is uh, it's great. So that is the future for for us is smart voucher workflow. 
Awesome. Over. Thank you, Mr. Sablon. So another question, and we did get one for improper improper payments, is uh, sure. does the trial balance affect improper pay? Trial balance. I think that's something that uh, they're probably doing within the command, if you guys are aware. Otherwise, this is going to turn into a counting issue. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, I, I think if, I, if, if we looked at it from an improper payment, the disbursement has already occurred. So from a, 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 a reporting perspective, it would be a part of the, the, the financial statements that we would have. If, in fact, that becomes an issue where that payment has to be collected, at some particular point because it's an improper payment. Obviously, that collection would then alter or change the financial statements to reflect that collection. At this particular point, we have not executed any collections as a result of the proper payments. What we're trying to do is to show where, if in fact we can make those the payments proper and support it, then that reduces the number of improper payments that we would have. And so that's where we're tracking it at this particular point. It's not the collections that have not been executed and as such, there's no change to the, the financial statements. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Crowder. All right, back to you, Mr. Sablon. Right. Uh, for the last thing I want to say about improper pay, if you look at the chart, you're going to see a 4.70%. So, so what is that all about? Well, it's a small sample that DFAS does, right? That's about 2.8 thousand uh, vouchers. And the total value is that is about $60.8 million. Take that figure right there and compare it to 1.3 billion. That's how you come up with 4.70. And that's all I have for uh, the first chart. So the second chart. So, so this is our uh, seven step journey to not necessarily 3.47, but to ensure that travelers uh, submit their vouchers properly with the right documentation, valid receipt, and they're approving officials doing their due diligence and making sure that they open the document and approve that. So the first thing we need to do is take a look at number one. We publish an Alarac, it, S1, that's out already. And what that Alarac does, it actually speaks to the role and responsibilities of the traveler, reviewing officials, and the approving officials. We're gonna start giving uh, commands the Army, the ACOMs, ASCCs, and DRUs, their individual rate every month. That's going to start soon. Number three, see it right there, we got uh, a number four. This uh, Carol Spangler just signed a memorandum. Uh, we got that Monday that tells the entire Army about us. Army Financial Management Command are going to be contacting, reaching out to all commands, and let's talk about improper pay, talk about the program, but basically how we can assist the units uh, improve their improper payments. And again, those the key again is the travelers and the approving official, or better yet, the certifying officers, because in DTS, you can be approving official, and when you sign that document, you are certifying officer, okay? And uh, the one you see number four is what Gil and I, and my teammate here, we team a lot in DTS. Uh, all I have is a GED education. I can say, but I can't spell it. But we briefed the same thing during the Army Financial Management and DFS customer uh, workshop last month. So everyone should have this already. So that's one of the communication, the strategic communications we have. And taking further another step is our command team, you know, Colonel Jennings, the commander, uh, Command Sergeant Major Kenneth Law, and our deputy to the CG is Mr. Hoffman. They're on tap. Their uh, parade rest might not waiting for us to say, hey, when are we going to start talking to the commands? Uh, it's not for us to say, hey, trade doc, you're, uh, you know, you're eight up. Uh, hey, trade doc, you're, you should do this. It's to help them, train them, guide us, and give them some, um, you know, some, some tips uh, to make it through. So it's not about chastising anyone because we're a team of teams here just to help them meet that 3.47. If we do those things that I just talked about, those three main things, main things, then we're going to surpass the 3.47. So on the very bottom, you see that that is zeros, right? Because we haven't started yet. We're waiting for that memo from Ms. Spangler. We got that. So now we're going to do and start, you know, marching 30 in step. And if you look at the very last two, once we complete all those steps, so you can ask me what's next. Well, if anyone likes to listen to uh, pop music, Brian McKnight about 20 years ago, his song was Back at One. So it's a perpetual, we're going to continue doing this until the end, I guess. Now, what Mr. Crowder mentioned is that we're showing efforts, we're showing improvements on what the Army is doing to improve proper pay, improper pay. 
We're not saying that DOD is going to take this away from the table because there are other programs besides just travel that they're looking at. But these are DOD level emphasis and it's a readiness issue for the Army and everybody else. Any questions on the second chart or anything on improper payments? Hey, sir, I would, I would like to ask, right? Most of the errors that you guys see over the years um, that you're, you've been seeing, do you think a lot of these errors are actually coming um, based on the traveler or is it, you know, just improper um, steps that have been taken by uh, users who are officials in the system? Uh, the ultimate responsibility for that and the biggest the biggest error that we found uh, throughout the year through uh, July through February is receipts, 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 invalid receipts. And there's certain elements for invalid for a receipt, name, name of the vendor, the amount, and things like that. And to make sure that that balance is paid off. There's a, they have put out about 10 years ago that your receipt requires a zero balance. That is incorrect. A receipt doesn't require require a zero balance. All it has to say is somewhere in that face of that receipt that that uh, balance is paid. It could be a government travel charge card. This is going to be collected, but that is no longer the, um, it's just a myth, but receipt doesn't require a zero balance. And only about one month, every, every month from July through February, every single month, the receipt for lodging, you know, airfare, and then you go get a car and you go sleep, right? Those three major expenses always makes the top five. All right, wow. that's that's three fifths of the top five. Except for November last year is the only month that the rental car, you know, won because we had no issue. And this is a sample now, it's a small sample that DFAS does. So every single month, except for November, it's always in value receipt either for your airfare, your rental car, or your lodging. Got it, sir. So there's another question that came in um, and it's more of, I think, a, a situation, right? Um, so perhaps maybe you can give some insight on this. It has to do with the manual 1610s actually that um, service members usually get en route to a school when they're going to a different uh, duty station. And obviously you cannot send all that manual 1610 in DTS. So they're having some issues settling it at the finance offices um, due to different um, you know, rates and stuff, i.e. for lodging uh, and or the the reimbursement for the meals. Uh, what is your suggestion on that? Are you talking PCS or uh, with TDY and route? Yeah. Uh, TDY and route, yeah. OK, and there's issue with uh, the lodging? Right, either so lodging and or the daily rate that they have. Um, and then, you know, they can't settle it in DTS, so they have to settle it at the finance right. office. So what's your suggestion on how to properly get the funds to that war fighter? Well, um, the, the first thing is first is that you might, we've got to make sure that the settlement voucher, right, is pay ready. Uh, make sure you have the orders, any amendments, any leave that they take, or any amendments to the 1610, and make sure the line of accounting is on there too. You have all those, and it should be paid ready to, to go through DFAS. DFAS pays that. We pay DFAS a certain amount to process those vouchers. If something goes wrong, if something's wrong, then we contact the traveler and say, hey, we need this, we need that. So as far as rates, that's all in the per diem uh, in a PDAXI website. So there should not be any issue with how much per diem they should get. The authority to pay soldiers per diem, whether it be lodging or meals, is in that 1610. Going to school is quite different because some, most of those have a set that you are required that you're going to eat, say, for example, in a DFAC, dining right. facility. All right. And sometimes they have that MOI that goes with that 6 and 10. They say when you go to Fort Benning, for example, the Army policy is that, you know, we're going to provide you breakfast and dinner or we're going to provide you lunch and the rest. You have to go on your own because of classes or where you reside when you TDY may be off post. And that way you get a proportional per diem rate, which is higher to account for those meals that you got to pay on your own. So it all depends on what that order says and what that soldier, uh, yeah, soldier or traveler uh, complies with when it goes TDY. But if there's any question about how much I'm getting paid, all you have to do is find uh, the amples out there, right? Uh, almost what we got 49, I believe, Army military pay offices. Right. Uh, if you have any travel questions or any question military pay, I would first check with my chain of command, chain of support. That's your S1 commander. And if they can answer it, 
that an apple should be able to answer that question for that uh, soldier. Because when you're in process, for example, that's when the finance briefing starts and we'll go over your travel voucher from beginning to the end and make sure we have all those documents handy, your signature to make that claim pay ready. Got it. Sir, uh, we have a, a interesting question over here. Um, and I know in long, long TDYs, this, is, this has actually been used because uh, sometimes it's cheaper to stay at, let's say, you know, a fully furnished apartment or something like that. Um, somebody's asking, with many group travelers request to use Airbnb, will DTMO grant authorization for each traveler to stay at their Airbnb with only one lodging receipt? No, lodging has to be separate, right? Uh, somewhere in that receipt has to identify JT Sublime and the days and how much I paid. Airbnb is not one of those uh, lodging that's in DTS. However, DOD cannot deny someone uh, reimbursement for lodging. All right, we have to reimburse somebody up to the maximum ceiling that says if you were to stay in, say, on Pulse and the and the rate is say $100, and you decide to stay in BRB and it's $150, all you're gonna get reimbursed is that that $100 because you chose to live on Pulse when it's something available there. Unless you get a statement of non-availability, but a, B, and B is not going to preclude you from getting reimbursed for your lodging. Okay. Another question that we have in- uh, Hold on, Matt, probably... you have something to uh, add. Yeah. Yep. The catch to the online booking locations, if they're using them, they have to have an itemized receipt. So it needs to show the rate charged, the taxes, the fees, everything has to be broken out. So we just have to make the, sure that whatever we're telling them, they have the proper documentation so we can pay it. Um, so that's one of the catches with that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, someone is asking that is there a clean sheet as to what the service member can look for on their 1610 to ensure that it is correct? Um, usually the uh, finance gets, you know, the finance office gets to ask questions on the 1610s, but since they cannot really verify the 1610s because they can't produce them. So is there some kind of like, you know, pre-filled, you know, Excel sheet or something that's tailored to a 1610 that can be distributed out? Yes, uh, I'll get that for, for you. There's a website that DFAS is an excellent website, as a matter of fact, that walks you through what should be on a DD form 1610 and it even shows you how to fill out a voucher. So I'll right. get that out to you. That's a do-all for me and I'll, I'll look for that. I'll collaborate with DFAS and get that information to you. Okay, and then officially from the from the DTS side of the house, um, receipts. Can a credit card statement be used uh, as a receipt? Is one of the questions showing the actual charge. Um, but I believe, Miss Miss Thompson, actually, you kind of said you know itemize is something that you look for, right? Right. Your government travel card does not have the proper documentation as far as right. what's required for a valid receipt. It can be used as a substantiating document. So if you have a statement in Lua, for example, um, that credit card receipt could be attached as well, ju just showing that statement, showing the validity of that charge. But it, in and of itself, it is not a valid receipt. Let, let me talk about that. So. Uh, the reference for the definition for valid receipt is, is in um, due to FMR volume nine in the definition. And it says that you got to have the name of the vendor. You got to have the dates, have the amount, any taxes, and to ensure that any the face of the receipt that is being it was paid off. So that that is the definition of a valid receipt and listening to DFAS and you can take and if you cannot find your receipt because you lost it because your pet ate it or whatever the reason is, then you can, um, as a last resort, you can uh, render a statement in lieu of receipt. Right. However, that statement has to have the same elements as a valid receipt, atomized yep. name. Now, if you look at the, the definition of that, it doesn't say you got to have your name right on the receipt. You're not going to find it in there. But how does DFAS know that that receipt is from JT? I don't put my name on there. You go to a hotel, you go to rent a car, guess what's on there? Your name. So just a note, make sure you put your name on there too and sign that. It's called silo, statement in lieu of a receipt. So that's only as a last resort. Resort. So if you don't have one, what do you do? Maybe you can use your phone and call the vendor. Maybe you can email the vendor or maybe they have a website you can get that. Or maybe you can have them faxed to you. 
But if you, you did all those, you exhausted all your made all attempts, then certainly by regulation you are entitled, you are authorized to provide that and render that statement in lieu of receipt. Over. Awesome. Thank you very much. I, I figured this was going to happen where you know a lot of folks were going to ask uh -huh, a lot of questions, different scenarios and things, right? Uh, maybe we're going to have to bring you guys back on um, and and you know have a whole session just with, just with the two of you. Um, but this time we're going to have to. Um, head on over back to Kuwait, um, and I believe we got uh, Mr. Stamsell back online. So over to you. All right, can you hear me this time? Uh, yes, we can. Thing. Yes, we can. Let's okay, so it's a little quick. bit choppy. Go ahead. All right, I'll just think real quick. Let's talk about uh, the EU cash store. Valley card, which is uh, now referred to as one card, right? Um, tell us all the exciting things that are happening with this uh, and the initiatives and, and you know what you're actually doing in Kuwait currently. OK, so uh, right now, as everybody knows, one card is is was coming out. This has been a, a talking point for quite some years of the one cards coming, the one cards coming. Well, it's finally here, right? So we are out here in Kuwait actually getting the CENTCOM region outfitted with the new one card equipment. Um, we have got a few areas already live on this. We started this with the um, Soto Kaido pilot in Honduras, where we actually fielded this system back in 2021 um, to do a test with that area, that region. And because it was centralized and people aren't, you know, moving back and forth between uh, different AOs, we chose that location to do as a test pilot. We worked all the bugs out during that pilot era. We had a few bumps in the road that we tried to fix with Treasury and um, FRB. We've got those issues resolved, and now we are here in Kuwait uh, going through Camp Buring and Camp Arab John and implementing the new one card. Uh, most of that, as everybody knows, it's been using the Eagle Cash components for um, a while now. They are well past their life expectancy. So we ever were in desperate need to get something out on the street that was new and improved. Um, so this is where we're at. Um, to give a little bit of the back history of this, um, the one card was brought into play um, based on a geo audit that happened back in 2008. So the findings of that geo audit came out and said that, you know, there's too many store value cards out there uh, that the Treasury and the uh, DOD are uh, in in charge of. So they came up with the findings that said everything had to be pushed down into one solution or one platform to use for store value cards. So at that time in 2009, um, there was a lot of the services came together and started to implement that new uh, platform. Um, and they were making headway as they went through uh, the designs and requirements and everything that they needed to go along with it. But then in 2014, the game kind of changed a little bit when President Obama signed an executive order mandating that all store value cards had to be EMV compliant or what we call Euro MasterCard Visa, which is a technology that was used throughout Europe. This is not new to anyone, I'm sure, that's in the, the audience right now. Um, most of you, if you pull out your debit or credit card, have an EMV chip on your card. Um, so this is what they, uh, the executive order mandated that we went through. Um, and this kind of changed the delay in the process of where we're at. So as these you know, conversations went down that one card's coming, it's coming. Well, everything that we were doing at this point up to 2014 stalled because we had to figure out how to make the EMV chip work in a closed loop environment. So the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank have a proprietary software that actually closes down the application to allow us to use these store value cards in an no star stereo environment, right? We don't need to have an internet connection for these payments and, and sales and loads and everything to work. We just need to have a device that can collect them and then send that signal out um, to uh, settle all those transactions at the rear end. So with that, it kind of stalled again. We had some Army cyber things that had to be going through. We had to test and pilot and do user acceptance testing. So we are finally here. Right, so we have finally got to the point where we're implementing it into Kuwait and throughout the other regions. So um, I just want to pause there to make sure everybody's tracking or answering any questions where we're going next or what we're doing. So I'll throw it back to you, Sarn Singh. Right. So I believe you kind of told us, you know, why this change happened. Right. And obviously, it was it was mandated and stuff. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the thresholds on that card. So limits, right? Um, and obviously this is usually used, you know, in, in deployed environments, but it's a very similar to the card that um, for those of you who've probably served in the past, you were actually issued one in basic training. And if I'm not mistaken, this is actually being piloted right now in Fort Jackson, South Carolina as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, how service members use it, where they can use it, things of that nature. Okay, yep, good question. So um, right now the new card is, it's called the Eagle Cash One card, and I didn't kind of brief on this earlier, but the main process that we're going to for the GA audit was to make a solution for one card for all services and one card instead of using four different entities that we currently use, right? So right now we have the Eagle Cash Store Value Card that is utilized for Army and Air Force. We have the uh, Navy cash, it's used on the Navy side, Marine card cash, and then we have the easy pay that you're, you're referencing here. Um, those four cards all had different systems and all had different hardware in order for them to use or function properly. So part of that was to consolidate them into a one platform environment. So now with the one card that you see over my shoulder here, that card is gonna be utilized in both easy pay type environments and through the Eagle Cash type environments out in the field as deployed soldiers go down range. There's no longer a need for a Navy member to have a Navy Cash or an Army member to have an Eagle Cash. One card is issued that is good for all services and all platforms. So the easy pay card that we're piloting in Fort Jackson is part of this. It's a two part process within our store value card that Army currently uses. So instead of issuing two separate cards to members, now we have the one card that actually has that EMV technology that allows it to have multiple purses. So when they go through basic training, the actual easy pay card has a purse uh, established on it that will be a pre-loaded amount of $350, right? That's for them to use for any toiletries or anything that they, the sundry items that they buy through their uh, time in basic training. The old easy pay cards, once they were done, the soldiers would throw them out. They didn't work anymore. They, you know, expired. And any of the residual funds that may have been on that card would then get deposited back into their military pay account. Now with one card, that is all going to change where the easy pay card is going to be issued like the easy Eagle Cash card. That purse will expire on the card, but then the card will be good for up to five or will be good for five years. So as that soldier transitions from basic training and goes into a unit, if that unit gets put on a patch chart and deploys downrange, when they go through their SRP, they'll take that card that they were issued, send it through the easy pay or the sorry, the SRP locations, and they'll reestablish that card as an Eagle Cash card, which then they'll associate it with an, a, a bank account that the member chooses to use. All these cards are still going to remain the same for those of you that have not deployed. The Eagle Cash is a, a tool that we use to prevent cash on the battlefield, right? So um, these cards are used where soldiers load money. You can load up to $350 a day on the card, up to $9,999 on your personal cards. Um, and that that dollar figure is controlled by Treasury. Uh, the 350 is the accepted risk that they allow soldiers to put on that card uh, for a daily amount. Uh, and then the $9,000 is just the, the card's limit. Anything over 10,000 has to be reported to the Treasury and the IRS and so on. So that's where you get your caps and your limits. Um, but it is only used in our deployed environments currently. Um, we are still operating in the closed loop environment. Um, we are looking at future iterations of one card to have the open loop capability where it can utilize it anywhere MasterCard is accepted. Um, but that's down the road. Um, but this is where we're at right now with the current card there. So I hope I answered your question. I just went a lot at you yeah, there. So awesome. No, it, it did. And and just to clarify for the audience that's watching, right? This is not replacing the government travel card, and neither is it re replacing the government purchase card. So please don't take this information and, and run with it thinking it's replacing those two cards. Yeah, you're correct. This is only going to be used for uh, downrange environment. Right, downrange environment for service members or anyone who's down there to use as a form of payment to keep cash off the battlefield. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, anything else that you would like to share um, before we, we move forward or have you covered everything? 
Um, the only thing I wanted to, to add to you is that we are still going live with our deployment. We are in the very beginning stages through the CENTCOM region. We've already accomplished uh, uh, one card through uh, all of Kuwait. So we have both Camp Beering and AJ complete. We do have a small team that is going to be working the um, Iraq region. Unfortunately, us we can't go into that region uh, as civilians. Um, and uh, like we talked earlier, I don't fit into my military uniform anymore, so I can't go over there as a military member. Um, but we do have soldiers in the finance arena that are going to implement this for us um, in the Iraq region. And then our team is going to come back here in the late September timeline and go through Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And that will kind of complete the CENTCOM uh, area of operation for all of the deployment of one card. And then we are going to move forward into the European theater and then start hitting up those locations within Kosovo, Romania, and Bulgaria. And that will complete the global tech refresh with the one card um, going forward. Got it. Awesome. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you um, dialing in all the way from Kuwait. Um, you know, so on behalf of the audience, ASAF, MNC team, thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry to make you retired, Sam Cell. All right. Um, we do Sergeant have a Jim. question. Sergeant Singh? We, yes. I uh, wanted to add a couple of, of initiatives that e-commerce uh, is involved with. And as you know, e-commerce has the responsibility for monitoring the banking overseas mission as well. And so Colonel John Jennings has uh, recognized that we need to, to grow banking officers. And so we have developed what we call the uh, short course for banking officers. We have just uh, started the first iteration and there will be a second iteration. And uh, my banking officer, Major Rivera, has developed a curriculum to give experience to banking officers if in fact they are needed uh, for further deployment for large scale operations. And so this course will be available for not only active, but also com Compost 2 and Compost 3. And that information has been uh, relayed to all commands who want to, uh, to give that to their soldiers to make application for that program. The second thing that I wanted to also talk about that uh, Tony, I'm sure would have said, is that we recognize that cryptocurrencies in everybody's vocabulary and vernacular. And my banking officer, myself, as well as Tony, we have taken training to be more, I guess you could say, informed of what cryptocurrency is about. And we're also trying to make sure that we can inform our senior leaders as to how cryptocurrency will be affecting the Army and where will we play. We, that, we have not developed that policy yet, but just wanted to let you know that we are looking at that particular area and giving advice uh, to the MILDEP as well as the use of FEMCOM commander. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Crowder. I appreciate you putting that in. We now have um, a question or two back to the to the you know to the team, uh, Mr. Thompson and him, Mr. Sablon. So um, we'll go over to them for a quick minute or two and just cover these questions. Um, and you know, one of them said that. Uh, let's see. OK, so if the traveler pays their debt, um, you know, on pay gov, uh, will that clear the due process in DTS? So the answer is yes, it may take some time um, because there is a lot of information. It has to go through a lot of different interfaces to get back and credit back into DTS. Right now we tell people kind of plan about 60 days to see that debt process close the loop in DTS. Um, but it will auto feed back into DTS in time. Awesome. Um, one other question, and if you need to add something, Mr. Sablon, you can always add it after, is um, are there any plans to facilitate the payment of government travel uh, credit card during the settlement of a PCS voucher? And the reason why is because most service members in process through finance and leave behind thinking that their GTC um, was paid and all the money they, they received belonged to them, right? So um, PCS move accounts for most of the delinquent and government travel cards. So any any uh, information on that? Uh, that wouldn't be in DTS, so I don't have much information from my side, JT. For as far as the payments, uh, and here's where it's very important that when you attend that finance in briefing or in processing, and they go through your your manual box. There's a place in the top of the DD form 
uh, 3351-2, a travel voucher, it has a little block that says, how much do I want to have the money that I'm due right. given over to the your travel card? Uh, responsibility is that traveler actually. So filling out that voucher is very crucial if they want to get their balance straight and they want to get paid to the cent once uh, DFAS makes that payment. So there is a, an option for travelers to put that on the travel voucher. Right. Then the, the way I would look at it is the outgoing unit should ensure that the service member is not leaving there with anything that's not cleared out yet. So uh, right. that would be that. Um, and, and, and also, we mentioned about the chain of command and chain of support, and when, you know, particular state of soldiers here, when they PCS, they have a what they call an installation clearance paper. So they have to see their their person in charge of their travel car so they can put that person's status. So that way they won't get delinquent in about a month. Okay, M status is making sure that, hey, you know, you're PCS and you are going to use your travel charge card so you have longer days to, you know, clear up your uh, the balance in your, your cart. Over. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, Team, again, to the to the AFS team, I just want to say thank you very much for, for coming on today. Um, you know, the hour always goes quick. Um, there's several questions that have come in. Some questions, you know, are more so for your commands to kind of dictate policy. Um, like the overall guidance that's out there. Um, we do owe you some answers in reference to point of contact slash um, some some other group box emails that we'll probably publish or we'll send out an email. Um, but you know, on behalf of the ASAF MNC team, thank you very much for um, for coming on today as guests uh, to the Youth Femcom team. Thank you uh, to our audience members. Um, you know, great attendance. Uh, appreciate the continuous support. Um, and again, these sessions are recorded and they are uploaded, so you can always go back and you can view it, or you can use it for uh, training or whatever else you choose to within your your organizations. Um, in terms of your CET credit, your supervisors need to sign the MFR stating that you attended the training, um, and this is not only for this one, but in prior episodes. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month when we host our next next session. So just be on the lookout for that email. Um, you know, down the road. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, we hope you had a great um, session today um, and you got something out of this. Um, and again, stay safe to support and serve. Have a good day.